ladies and gentlemen, or lady and gentlemen, you're in your <laughs> automobiles, you're in your seats, you're all buckled in. Yeah. Hi, everybody. And this is this is hot off the press. It is actually President's Day, and this thing is going to be up tonight, sometime in the middle of the night. Tomorrow. 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 But, you know, sometime soon. Hot off the press. 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 Hot off the press. The press. <laughs> Yes. yes. Uh a little dysfunctional today. It's okay. Um anyway, so uh <laughs> anywho, yeah, today's episode is gonna be all coming from Justin. Me and you are both going in blind on these ones. I have no idea what we're in for, except the overall theme he's giving us right now is work life balance. Okay. So we'll see if by the end of it we have a crafty little title. Do you feel like you guys have mastered that topic? Well, I think that you have no. been you have been really at it trying to master it in the last couple of weeks because the other night you said, I am really burnt out. I am just gonna go climb into my goggles and I'm gonna play play my video games. Yeah. Yeah, I it's think, getting worse. I think we've all been dealing with some burnout and it is hard to come back from I heard um, the other day, and I don't know if this is true or not, so I could be lying right now to everyone, but I heard that it can take up to three years to come back from a serious burnout. Really? Yeah. So look after yourselves. Make sure you're maintaining that work-life balance, preventing burnout. But let's see. Let's see if we can, you know, if you can't, if you can't do teach is the saying, so maybe... Maybe that'll be well, us I, today. Before we before we dig in, I just want to know, did you guys have fun last week? Last week was our first live show in Charlotte, North Carolina. Absolutely loved it. Loved Charlotte. Loved meeting everyone. Um, we did two meet and greets, so about 100 people one-on-one, -on -one, and it was amazing. And uh, he came back before you came back. He did. He flew back the next morning. And what were you doing? I was out having a good time, seeing Charlotte, enjoying some amazing food. Um, for those that live in Charlotte, I went to Malpan, M-A-L-P-A-N, Malpan, Malpan. Mm -hmm. um, amazing, amazing, amazing. I went to my friend Sarah's Pilates, like mixed strength training class at Solid Core, mm -hmm. South Park or Southgate. I don't know. Whatever one is by the mall. So this is where Sarah moved. Yeah, Sarah lives there now. Wow. So Speaking it was of which, really fun. I need to get my phone because I have something I was supposed to share with you. Oh, go get it. Here's what I have for you. Yes, sir. So we met a girl named Elizabeth in the meet and greets. Okay. And she came up to me and told me something about you. And I told her to send it to me because I'd forget. And I <laughs> wanted to share it with you. Okay. And I felt like we should do it here. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. So she said, Elizabeth said, Hi, I met you guys at the meet and greet in Charlotte, and I had mentioned that my father had passed away a few years ago, and just how much Jerry and Father Knows means to me, as well as Two Hot Takes. Thank you all so much for all that you do. Well, thank, thank you, Elizabeth, you. and I'm glad we're here and we, can, we, we get to be there for one another. Yeah. She said she was very thankful for Jerry. <laughs> you might be one of the only ones. No. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people out there, but are we ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Okay. Okay, up first. Hi, Morgan, Justin, and Jerry. I'm 22. In May of 2023, I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Photography. I decided to take the summer to relax as I was burned out and doing college during the pandemic was more stressful than I anticipated. I started looking for jobs in September of 2023. I have had a difficult time finding photography jobs, specifically assisting. I get interviews, but I either find out the pay is very low, the hours are horrible, some asked for 10-hour days, or very late nights, and even just not being interested in the job as the employer describes it. And as well, of course, the jobs I really want either are not interested in me or tell me that they are moving in a different direction. I have been interviewed and never heard from them after sending a follow-up email. I've even had scheduled an interview over the phone and the employer never called. 
I'm getting frustrated and lost. I was already dreading moving back home from the city to my parents' house and living in my hometown that I dislike strongly. I feel like the four years I spent studying and attending college, even during a pandemic, were not worth it. I worked hard and spent all my attention on being creative and being the best student. Now, I feel like it didn't pay off. I have no job, I live at home, I have no money, and I cannot even get a receptionist job to get some income. I need advice or something. Ideal outcome, have advice, maybe some kind of direction to have hope again. This person's been trying to interview and just has been unsuccessful getting the job through the interviews. Yeah, basically started applying in September of 2023. And getting nowhere. Yeah. So my first thing is, is record yourself interviewing. I want you to to try to record yourself and listen to how the interview goes and, and how you see yourself delivering the information. Because a lot of times in the interview process, you may know your you may know your topic extremely well, but something else is going on in that interview where it's not being communicated that you know that you know your product. And they're getting a warning sign. And so try to just see if you see that. And then you may also want to go to a professional interview coach, someone that can actually help you go through the interview process, sharpen you up. And that way, when you go in for the interview, you really are killing it. You know exactly how to, how to present your product, how to present yourself. And when they, when they look to hire you, they already know that you are their person. There's no one else they're considering. It's not about money. It's they can't wait to get you. And that might just be by sharpening the skill. So that's my first that's my first thought. Yeah. Let's continue on. What do you guys think? I feel like in music, there's so many different ways to attack it because it's it's naturally not an employee uh, situation. But mm-hmm. it's photography is equally as creative in the in the sense that I'm sure there's a lot of photography uh local clubs and competitions and I don't know, big events. There's got to be conventions and everything about all the new products or, Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's different things that bring a lot of photographers together. And I just wonder if instead of approaching this world with, instead of going through the internet and submitting job applications, like you would a regular nine to five, why not go the more creative industry route where you're going to meet someone more organically, more naturally in a way that you're looked at, I feel like a little differently. I feel like there's a difference between I'm applying as an applicant to a job versus, oh, we met in in a way where it's not it's not so formal. More than traditional networking sense. Mm-hmm. And I think that would be really good if you like print it off of like a booklet, a portfolio and go to like conventions or networking meetups and things like that and meet someone. And even if you don't get a job through whoever you meet, it's who you know a lot of times and being personable and connecting and showing your face, I think goes a lot farther than just submitting an application. And yeah. I, and I also suggest that in the meantime, since you are an artist, meaning, you know, a photographer, Find the, the, the specialty that you really enjoy doing and post them, maybe in exhibits, maybe in parks, maybe in things that people can kind of see what you're doing and see that you're very unique with your eye. And believe it or not, you become self-employed. And someone may also see you that might be able to use you as a commercial photographer or, or such. But meanwhile, you're still making a living doing what you love, taking pictures. When I see a lot of people doing free shoots Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. just get promo. A lot of the shows I've played, there's usually two or three random photographers at the venue that you have no idea who they are. They take a bunch of awesome pictures while you're performing and then they just send them all to you, hoping that, you know, you you give them a credit when you post these photos, but also maybe you're like, wow, I love this person's work. When I get a big tour... I'll take them with. Mm-hmm. And then that's, you know, if any of these things can turn into jobs, just depending on which 
field of photography you want to be in. Yeah. And you can watermark these pictures so that if they want to buy the picture without the watermark. Absolutely. That's what I would do. And you can even do stuff where you take these these pictures and you turn them into paintings. I mean, there are so many different things that you can do for people. It's just your imagination and, and you taking advantage of what um, uh, medi is medium that you can turn it into from the photograph. I think my biggest advice would be use socials to your advantage. I think Pinterest, Pinterest, I don't know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. is incredible. It's actually more used than Google as a search engine. TikTok, Instagram, post your pictures, do free shoots for people, message people that are going to be performing at various venues asking if you can photograph for them. But get out there do the photography, start posting, start creating content with it because look what posting on TikTok can do. We are sitting here because of it. I don't think I'd have a podcast without social media. So I think if you can get out there and showcase your pictures in a cool way and use hashtags and, you know, SEO appropriately, I think you could do really, really well with that. Um, I know wedding photography is a crazy niche I have a friend right now getting married and she only wants to spend like two, three grand, cannot find a photographer to do it, is begging family friends like that know how to work a camera to to do it for her mm -hmm. um, because it's just so expensive. So I think that's one niche. If you could start shadowing someone, maybe the first couple weddings, you volunteer to be their second shooter for free to build a portfolio for yourself and start working for yourself. But um, if you do decide to venture away from photography, that's okay. Um, I don't use my degree, but it does sound like this is a passion for you. So I think you can find a lot of creative ways to start being your own boss and not have to do so many interviews. I'm well, just because you. you're not in your specialty, let's say your specialty is sports photography. Mm -hmm. Just because you're not shooting sports, are you going to be mad that you're working in a world where you're you're doing photography, but it's at weddings. You know, we think about it in music where, yeah, maybe we don't want to be working on this specific, you know, busy work of this huge commercial campaign that's taking a bunch of months, but we're also doing it to make a living in music versus going and getting a job outside of the field you're passionate about. So I think whether, whatever it is within photography, I'd go for it because it's all going to build to what you're hopefully you just going add, for in the end. Yep. You keep adding to the portfolio. And like, once you get established, it's easier to then sell yourself and say, Hey, I got three years. I've been making a business for myself doing photography. Here's some shots. I can shoot sports, even though I've been doing weddings. Like you just got to get your foot in the door. You, you can yep. shoot anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going from commercial you're doing homes. You could be doing, I mean, from few, I mean, from one, from A to Z and whatever. You could do anything. Anything. Homes, so, home photographers make a lot of money too. And I think it sucks working for free. I know you're talented. You've spent time, energy, money on a great degree, you know, to prove that you can back it up. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you got to work for free to get started and maybe message, you know, some influencers in your area take pictures for free in exchange for posting. You know, there's there's a lot of different ways you can Most important get way, in there. find out what you like to shoot and then work from there. And that's that would be the next step. Yeah, moving along. Okay. This message is sponsored by Greenlight. When you're a parent, you already have enough pressure on your plate and enough of those big talks that you have to have with your kids. And one of them is money. And it is hard. I know for me, I didn't get a lot of that growing up as a kid. So I had no idea where to begin when I had my own money, a card to use. I went a little wild. Well, Greenlight is here to help. Greenlight is a debit card and money app made for families. And it's meant to work with your family. So Greenlight actually lets you send instant money transfers. And it gives real-time notifications of spending, managing chores, and automating allowances. For me as a kid, I earned money all around the farm. Every horse stall I cleaned, I got five bucks. But trust me, I would not have dilly-dallied as 
much as I did if when I completed my chores, that money got instantly transferred to a debit card that I could then use. I actually use the Greenlight app and it is so easy to set up and get started. And this is going to help your kids build that financial literacy and independence by learning how to earn money, saving, and spending wisely. And it's so important to do. I actually asked my dad to help with this read and he laughed at me. He said, I actually never learned how to budget, which is why I'm so bad with my money. So don't be like dad when it comes to money and get green light. So stop putting off the money talk and start putting your kids on the right path. Sign up for green light today and get your first month free at greenlight.com slash FKS. That's greenlight.com slash FKS to try green light for free. Greenlight.com slash FKS. Okay, some trigger warnings for the next one, you guys. It does contain talks of sexual harassment, SA, and ED. Um, it's a bit of a heavy one, so if you feel that like you can't handle that today, feel free to skip. Hello, FKS crew. For a long time, I've been stuck in a job that I hate, and I'd like to vent or even just get some advice on how to cope, as I can't change my situation just yet. I've been a nanny for almost eight years now, having looked after the children of five families, the fifth of which I have been working for for the last four years. My first three families were great and I had no problems, but when I moved over to my fourth family is when the problems began. The father was a swinger and was incredibly sexually suggestive in front of the children, talking about his sex life with his girlfriends and their sex parties they attended. He often made covert sexual advances toward me. It then became overt one day when he smacked me on the bum with a wooden spoon and laughed while he told me I was naughty for not checking his daughter's homework book. Disgusting. His daughter was there when it happened and I felt sick, even more so because I felt I could not say or do anything out of the fear that I would lose my job. Fast forward to a couple of months later, he told me he had lost his job and he could not employ me any longer. Immediately after which, he asked me if I'd like to join him at one of his sex parties. I left that day without work or self-esteem. My latest family has come with their own set of challenges. The mother is an extreme perfectionist in all aspects and enlists me to enforce her strict diet and exercise regime on one of her children who is slightly overweight. I feel so uncomfortable doing so as I have seen how it has affected this child. She always tells me that she is fat and weighs herself regularly. She is only nine. I feel uncomfortable being a part of this as I see how it can turn into an eating disorder for this child. My mother encouraged me to take laxatives when I was a teenager, so I feel this on a deep level. I try to tell her how beautiful she is inside and out every chance I get as it crushes me to see. I left work crying all the way home last year after an incident where the mother scolded their maid for eating their food, even though I see food overflowing to the point of spoiling in the fridge. The parents also make comments about how bad their maid smells. This breaks my heart because I know she cannot bathe regularly due to the extreme poverty she lives in. The father has always been kind and him and I get along well, but he sits and watches me often as I run around after the children. One day as I was laying the children's clothing on the bed, I caught him turning the camera on his phone around so the person on his video call could see me. I knew this because the person on the phone shouted hello, but thought I was the mother as we look alike. His intention was obviously to show me to his friend on the phone without me knowing. I feel stuck, depressed, and anxious to go to work each day. I dread it, but I cannot afford to lose the job. I guess the most important thing that I could see is that people are having behavior that is unacceptable. And the only answer that you can really immediately do is walk out. You do not stay in an environment where people are going to be... Um, dangerous. Uh, yeah. Could be. It's time to start looking for a new job. I know Not, you can't you, afford you walk to out. quit this one. You've got to walk out. But the reality is people have bills to pay. They need to eat. They need to keep roofs over their heads. So if it is truly not doable to quit, you need to start looking for a new job today. Today. Don't wait until something happens with this one. Don't try to stick it out. Start looking so, today. So do you think that she should, or 
immediately go to the individual and say, this is a, a behavior that won't be tolerated. I don't appreciate this behavior. This yeah. isn't professional. I think you can call out people. Um, I think if we start with family number four, like that is very clearly sexual harassment, sexual assault with hitting her on the bum with a wooden spoon. You could sue for that. So that you could have you could have pressed charges for. You could sue. You got to be comfortable advocating for yourself. That was just a terrible situation. And, you know, luckily he lost his job and you were able to get out. Uh, but even now, this dad recording you, I think you can advocate for yourself and say, hey, it's a boundary for me that I'm not in any pictures. I don't appreciate being video recorded when I'm turned around. Please respect my boundaries. I'm trying to maintain my professionalism with you guys, but that's just not, that's not negotiable for me. You're working for them. You have certain rights too. I think you can also say to the mom, I have priorities. They are to keep your children safe and healthy while I watch them, but I won't be enforcing things that I'm not comfortable with. Point blank. If they have a problem with that and they have a problem with you not giving their daughter you know, cake or whatever, whatever weird rules she has, then that is what it is. But you don't have to do things that you find unsafe or that make you feel bad. Absolutely. You have to define what is acceptable. And, and if it, if it's just going to them and saying, I don't think this is a good, a, 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 a good relationship or a good, what's the word I'm looking for with, with a good mix match a good match to work with, you know to work with i think i have to give you my notice it's, it's, there are things that just and if they say you want to tell me what they are you'll say yes i'll be glad to the you know the sexual harassment is not acceptable mm -hmm. or the fact that you have a certain behavior with your children that i just don't i don't i don't find comfortable to deal with no a 9 year old calling themselves fat and hopping on a scale all the time not healthy right. at all. And it's hard because I think, I don't know, you know, I was a nanny and I think you can say things in a professional way, kind of like I said, like, you know, I'm going to make sure your kids are safe and healthy, but I don't feel comfortable enforcing certain things and I just won't do that. Mm -hmm. You as their parent, obviously that is your right, um, but I just won't do that. I think you can say things like that, but I don't think you can go to the mom and say, hey, your behavior is toxic. You're going to cause an ED, an eating disorder in your kid. I quit. I think there's a certain level of professionalism still. And I agree. if it's as you're walking out and you want to warn her and say, hey, you know, my mom did some things that really I was affected by. It caused me to have an eating disorder. I would just be very careful with your children. Mm -hmm. You know, I noticed some unhealthy behaviors, her weighing herself and calling herself fat isn't really healthy. Would I be correct by just saying she hold this this person holds the power to to choose their destiny if they want to stay or leave or what yeah. behavior they want. Yeah, I think you gotta you start applying key. for jobs. You hold the key. You gotta start applying and looking for other jobs. If you're here in the States, I'm not sure if it mentions, but if you're here in the States, care.com is an amazing place to find nanny jobs. Um when I hear the word I, I took a, a spoon to my bum, I think that she's from Britain. Yeah, it could, like it could be the UK. It definitely could be the UK. So I'm going to add the ideal and the anything else okay. before I give my thought. Okay. I would just like to be able to get through the next two years without feeling like I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to lose hope and tenacity. Giving my son a better future and improving my life is just a little step away. Anything else, this is the only job that enables me to fetch my child from school and take him with me to work as I can't afford childcare of my own and I don't have family members who can help me. I can't see myself finding other employers who would take on a nanny who's, who needs to collect her child from school in between running after their kids, which my current employers have been gracious enough to allow. I have two more years of my postgraduate degree, which I do part-time. I need this job to help pay for school and mine and my child's necessities, but I'm struggling with the thought that I will need to endure two more years of this. At the end of all of it, it says, any advice or encouragement to help me keep going would be so helpful. And I think it's kind of a mix of both, right? It's if you cannot leave this position right now, then I think we need to encourage you to endure 
but have your eyes open and actively searching for better options for yourself. As soon as one comes up and you're comfortable to switch, then make that jump. So I think it's a mix of encouraging you, though how bad and terrible of a situation it is, if one of your main goals is giving your son a better future and improving your life, then, you know, un, unless something else that can take you out of here pops up, you may need to endure for a while. And that just is the, the crappy reality of it. But even you say here is a little step away. And so think about, I, I imagine you can find somewhat of a better situation long before two years comes up. So think of it in smaller chunks of time and say, well, if it only takes me one more month and I a position like some other family pops up or something, then I just got to get through this month or whatever it may be just to keep yourself going to then get to the point where you can have all these things that you've been working so hard for. I think it's going to be so attainable to find another family that will let you pick up your kid and I do too. be there in the afternoons. Like I know here in the States, child care is so, so expensive. Daycare costs, after school program costs, like there's, they're so expensive. So I think you could, if you put yourself out there, get on care.com or, you know, a UK website, wherever you are, there's probably a website and start applying for other jobs today and just be upfront. I have to pick up my kid from school. That's a part of it. You'll see a, a decrease in my rate because of this or, you know, however you want to say it, but yep. start applying for a new job because you do not deserve to be miserable. And two years is going to fly by. That's my, right. my grad program was three and it was done in a blink. So you got this. Just hang in there. Yeah. I'm I'm wondering if you guys, you know, are gonna are suggesting to her if she is is making the choice to stay there for the next two years, does she call these people out or does she just shut up and take it? I know what my feeling is, but I'm I think curious if, what your thoughts are. If you call them out today and expect a job tomorrow, I don't know if you would have a job tomorrow. That's correct. So it is this battle of I need to keep a roof over my head, be able to afford school, all of these things, you know, she mentions. And so until then, until your job lined up, you start the next day and you're walking out the door. I think until then, you can't say much in regards to things that are other than just setting a boundary. But again, like if this is a family that's just crazy and if you you feel that it's unsafe to say, hey, I have a boundary to not be in videos. Please do not take pictures of me. If you feel they're going to fire you for that, this is a, it's a dicey situation because it's not the traditional employment sense. I don't I don't know if, she, you know, she mentions a contract with them. I don't know if it's regulated through an agency, but if you're just working for a family, it's kind of at will. They can fire you for any reason they want. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of pick your battles until you get something else lined up. Yeah. Well, I, in, in no, I, I want to make it clear. I don't recommend to anybody that you work in an environment where you're being harassed and you can be putting yourself into further danger. So it's a decision that you get to make. But if you're asking for an opinion, my opinion is never put yourself in harm's way. Period. Okay. Keep us posted. <laughs> Another one of this week's partners is ZocDoc. Do you have anyone in your life that just has zero filter? You walked into a holiday party wearing a sweater. Not your best look. And you will know quickly. I've even had doctors that have no filter. Told me I was overweight. Just crazy things that didn't relate to what I was coming in for. Well... Thanks to ZocDoc, you can find a doctor who has a filter and is going to make you feel comfortable and actually listen to you. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. I had a pregnancy scare a little over a year ago now. I was terrified. So sure enough, I get on ZocDoc because that's where my gyno is and I was able to book an appointment the next day. And my gyno isn't the only doctor I've found on ZocDoc, but the results are consistent. I 
get doctors who listen to me, work towards my treatment goals, don't brush me off or say I'm just stressed. And I know that they're going to take my insurance before I even walk in the door. I love, love, love using ZocDoc. It's made accessing healthcare a whole lot easier. So if you're ready to try for yourself, go to ZocDoc.com slash FKS and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash FKS. ZocDoc.com slash FKS. Number three. Yes? I work at a small law firm in the real estate industry as a paralegal which has been struggling lately due to the current economy and high interest rates. We did have two attorneys, the original owner, mid-60s, and a new attorney, early 30s. The plan was that the end of 2023, the original owner would retire and the younger attorney would take over. However, on January 4th, 2024, the younger attorney packed his stuff in the middle of the night and left without a word. We were all devastated and overall confused, The original owner was obviously very upset and is worried about the future of the firm. I was called in his office shortly after the young attorney left, and he told me he could only guarantee my employment until the end of 2024. Fast forward to now. The younger attorney has approached me and asked if I would come work for him. I really like working under him, and I believe we work well together. I think this would be a great step in my career and it is obviously a more secure job considering my current boss's imminent retirement. I have been stressed about this for weeks, and I don't know what to do. My current boss and coworkers will undoubtedly be angry that I'm leaving to work with the trader, but this is something I really want to do. Would it be awful for me to go? Ideal outcome, that I could go to the new job without anyone being mad at me. Additional info, I'm currently 24, and getting in on the ground floor of this firm could set me up for life. The elder lawyer, who's in his 60s, made it very clear he's shutting, he's shutting the practice down. Mm-hmm. And your job is to look out and go forward with your life. So you don't have to be ashamed by saying, I know that we talked about the end of the year. And by the way, we are now in going into March. So she's got 10 months before the before the end of the practice. So the answer is, is, you know, the fact that someone's given you, you know, um, an environment, I, it would be interesting to see if they're going to give you a work, a, uh, a working contract. They're going to hire you, you know, at least for the, you know, two year or three year contract. Cause right now, you know, you got one year left and this guy could actually hire you and get mad at you tomorrow and fire you. So I would make sure I'm covered. You know, I, that if you're leaving one job that you know you're there to the end of the year, you certainly want to make sure that you are covered with this job for that or better. Yeah. I mean, you're on a sinking ship. So in my eyes, I would I would rather secure my future. And you saying getting in on the ground floor of this firm could set me up for life. It's kind of a no brainer. Sinking ship done by the end of the year. New ship sailing very, very well. We don't know how well he's doing though. Yeah, we don't know, but I think the odds are probably pretty good. Um, And if you're so good at your job that someone's poaching you, I think you should be okay to find a new one if it fails. But I think asking about an employment contract guaranteed pay for a year, that would be great because then it's like, well, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, I would just take a business response. I would take a business outlook at this thing and see what he's done, what he's got, what he's logged, what he's doing, making sure that you have a good sense that he is real. He's going to be there, and this thing is really going to grow. I wouldn't go into it like a na- like like a naive, uh, innocent person who has no ex- ex- experience in business. This you've been doing this. You have an idea to track to see if this person's actually working has deals in the hopper and things are things are going to continue to cook for you. Well, I mean, it, by the sounds of it, they did work with him. So, right, you know, we, I want to know what he's doing now. I'm sure he took all of his clients with him. I'm sure there was a disagreement between him and the old attorney and didn't want to be partners anymore, went his own, you know, firm route. Mm-hmm. But he still got all of those clients. I mean, he takes his books with him and, you know, we're assuming presumably would have those same billable hours. My answer to you is, you know, check it out. Make sure that you're making a good business decision. Definitely. What are your thoughts on this one? The thing I can't get out of my head is the fact that he was in line to take this thing over. He would have been head honcho. 
Right, you're but, at the very top. Right, but and he probably so, had a buyout though. The situation is he left for a reason instead of taking it over. And so I'm I'm always, you know, I'm more more tempted to follow the person that's hungry and ready and there's something new happening and like let's go versus something where it's now it's very uncertain, but there's a reason the jump was made. Mm-hmm. I think you could ask him that though. Like if you're you know, if you have a really good relationship with him and it sounds like you do, you know, we work really well together. I think you could ask, you could just say like, hey, I'm I'm really interested in this. I just, you know, for transparency and my personal confidence, would you be comfortable sharing why you left? You know, I just want to make sure that I'm making a sound decision for my future. And I think you can ask that. Absolutely. But I would think it has more to do with the demands that the senior partner was asking for, the buyout agreement. Sometimes those things just get messy. I think that's exactly correct. Don't go into it blindly. Make sure that you take the responsibility and the due diligence to make this decision in a business sense, because this is your business partner, you know, basically. Yeah, definitely. And you should guys have the... Uh, clarity between each other and the understanding of each other that you can trust one another Mm -hmm. because he did literally pack up in the middle of the night he packed up in the middle of the night and walked out on that guy it's a little it's a little concerning Mm -hmm. yeah i mean maybe he found out the guy was committing fraud or doing something no i think it's i think there's just an opportunity to be had we just don't ask him yeah let's find out for yourself okay number four okay let's go My fiance, 26 male, and I, 24 female, have been house hunting. We recently fell in love with a house, so we put our offer in, and it got accepted. I think maybe we were in a little bit of denial at first because we've been denied so many times. I get that. So we really didn't think we'd win this bid. Anyway, the part I need advice on is the fact that after putting down the down payment on this house, it will mostly deplete bank accounts, savings, and all. We both work pretty good jobs, but have had to spend large amounts of money on things because life happens. Fuel oil for the apartment we currently live in and winter tires for both of our vehicles. At first, we were all in and said we'd just figure it out. But the more we talk about it, the more stressed and worried we are. After doing the math, we would both only be saving around 700 a month, and that doesn't include us being able to do any of our hobbies. We will literally be broke. And on top of that, owning a house is a huge responsibility. So if anything goes wrong, we won't have a savings to fall back on for repairs. So are we being stupid for trying to buy a house at this point in time? We are so ready for this next step, but maybe the timing isn't right. All caps, please help. You guys are going to take this one from the beginning. Oh, it's so exciting, but so stressful. Um, My first thought is, are you maybe overextending yourself? Like you got approved. So obviously you are financially secure enough to where a bank would approve you for a mortgage. But my thought is maybe you just are going to the max of your buying power when you should be going something a little smaller where you're then saving more than $700 a month to replenish your savings, to have money for your house fund, if things go wrong, your hobbies, you know, whatever, because maybe you can buy up to a $500,000 house, but you'd probably be smarter buying the $300,000 house. Obviously, is it ideal? No, but you know, it's your starter home. It's the one you get into first, stay there a couple of years, build some equity and then sell and things like that. But, you know, there's also the flip side of this where my friend, uh, Sarah and Dinell just got a house in Charlotte where we stayed and they went into it with with a different mindset. And their mindset was based on advice that Dinell got from his dad. And his dad said, shop with the intention that It might be your first home, but if you hit rock bottom, it could be a home for your family. Right. Like, it's not necessarily, you're not going too small. Um, But, you know, there's strategy in all of this. The market is soft in some areas. It's still crazy in others. So it really just depends on what's right for you. But 
in my head, if I were you guys, I would go a little smaller to make sure there's a bit more wiggle room and cushion for when life does happen. Yeah, I've, I've, you know, I've made choices in my life where I was betting on future money and I got lucky, but it, you know, something like a house, there, there is the thought that once, if you can get in it and be in it for a little bit, there is the thought that you can always technically get out. You might just lose. You might lose and, you know, maybe you get some of your equity out of it because, you know, the house price could go up and then you sell because you have to and you get a, who knows, but that's betting on, that's like betting on the stock market. Yeah. But this is called being house poor. This is, And yeah. so when you look up being house poor, I think the the main thing they want you to think of are not only the costs and the closing costs of a physically purchasing the house, but future things like you were mentioning, home ownership costs, property taxes, any homeowners associate association type things. Your dryer breaks. What maintenance do you Maintenance expenses. Oh, stuff will go wrong. You will find termite damage. You will find rat shit infested throughout your house. And so in it's this, never perfect. They, like right under this thing, how can I avoid becoming house poor? If you're thinking about buying a home, first create your post home buying budget, which it sounds like you have done. Make sure you include line items for things you love and do not want to give up. By all means, get a handle on your mindless spending, but don't plan on giving up everything you love when you buy a house or you're going to come to resent your home. Consider buying a starter home or a condo if you're not yet ready to give up your lifestyle in favor of owning your forever home. These tend to be smaller in size and closer to urban centers, which tends to reduce transportation costs. You know, so there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. But it's... It's scary to put yourself in a position where if something big came up that you weren't expecting and you have a huge expense sitting there, that could ruin everything. And that's really scary. Yeah. And I mean, there are credit cards that you can do for emergency emergencies and then, you know, pay it off within the specified time period. But you don't want to bank on that. I also think like, yes, you're saving $700 a month, which is a decent chunk, but then your money is also building equity. Like it's going into a house that you then have that asset. You can sell down the road, you know, so that's a little bit better. But yeah. you also could consider like, hey, you know, two days a week, we're going to walk dogs on Rover or drive for Uber and make some extra money to like add to that, that then that's our hobby money fund. And the savings goes into the house safety net fund. So there's there's ways you can do it. And then that's a goal for a year until you have a bigger cushion and then you could stop. Like, I think there's there's different strategies everyone plays by. You just have to do what's going to be the most comfortable and safe for you guys. So $8,400 a year. Mm -hmm. So here's dad's experience. I've done rent. I've done buy. I have friends that have... Uh, done both. And I'm going to share you a quick story of a friend of mine who everyone thought was the most extremely wealthy guy in the world. He can write checks like left and right, wouldn't bother him. He built a home and by the time he was done building that home, he had no money for furniture. And let me tell you, he didn't sell the home. He continued their life. They put things in slowly. They bought things slowly. They worked hard. And before you know it, their home was furnished. Might have taken 10 years before they really got there, mm -hmm. but they built a life. They had a kid. They, they, they really did do their, their, their thing and they grew and they have their home. The $8,400 is a, is a big number. Yeah, it is. And you are building equity. And I have a friend that bought a home last year. He thought he would give a new life and try it. So he moved to Atlanta, bought a home. Bought it in Atlanta to save a lot of money. Here. And mm -hmm. he lived in the year and he decided he was depressed in Atlanta, sell the house. <laughs> made $150,000 on the house. In just a year. In a year. Yeah, not putting any work in. So, you know, long as if you guys have any ability of being do-it-yourselfers, um, consider that. Put some money away every month if you can just to put it in a, in a, in a, 
and a can buried in the ground that if, if something comes up, you can you know buy paint or you can do things to slowly make it look a little nicer. That if you decide you ever do have to sell it, that you can move and you can actually make it, you know, move quicker and make some money on it. So if you bought it right, then I wouldn't worry about it. If you feel that you overpaid and you're scared shitless on what you paid, that's a different deal. But you've already taken consideration of the tax. You've already taken consideration of the... Um, Closing costs. Even even the the bills, the gas, the utilities, what's going to come up. You've, you've done all that or you wouldn't have gone in the house. Yeah. And just do what people do in America. We work to try to improve ourselves, make more money and and better our lives and and it's priorities. And I think you guys will be great. So I I wouldn't run and hide. I would take it face on and and build your life. This is what it is, do, building a life together. Yeah, and I think the market right now feels like it's in a better place. Obviously things come up. Look at the 2008 crash. Mm -hmm. But um, if you can sit in it and hold, then you, know, you should be okay. Um, I love Facebook Marketplace. I think buying smart, um, cheap, like options is amazing. We we went crazy on Facebook Marketplace from our an offer up an offer up um, Craigslist. But we we bought our pendant lights for our kitchen. We've bought console tables, chairs, our dining room table. We've basically bought everything secondhand except our beautiful kitchen that's coming from Modern Twig. But that's IKEA because we wanted to save a lot of money and our couch and our new bed frame. But otherwise, it's like. It's all secondhand. We're thrifty. If you want to be thrifty, you could also buy stuff and flip it for extra money. Yeah. Um, there's so many, so many options. So if at this point, by the time you're hearing it, you did get the house, no stress. If you walked away from the house, I mean, it's, what, it's, we, it's whatever. We, we move on and move you forward. You move on. You find a, a better house, it wasn't, maybe cheaper. We use the word it wasn't meant to be. It wasn't meant to be. But let us know what you did. Um, but for those out there that might be able to relate or in the same position soon, hope we helped. Okay. We're going moving on to number five. The last one. Another one of this week's partners is Factor. I have become such a foodie. I love good, delicious, healthy meals, especially ones that I don't have to make, which is why I love Factor. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating better every day easy. Seriously, these meals get shipped right to your door, most of which you can cook in just two minutes, and they're amazing. I've gotten amazing chicken fajita bowls, and there's so many different options to choose from each week. There's over 35 different options that include keto, calorie smart, vegan, and veggie, and more. And the add-ons. Okay, this is what really, really, really sold me on Factor. In the last box I got from them, they included these protein shakes. And for someone that doesn't really like a big meal in the morning or doesn't have a lot of time, they got me on the right foot in the morning. I had a really good, nutritious meal, and they taste amazing. Amazing. And they even have juices now. So you really can't go wrong. And something I really love about Factor is that each meal is dietitian approved. So if you have a busy schedule and life and just want to eat healthy or you're like me and just hate cooking, Factor's got you covered. Head to factormeals.com slash FKS50 and use code FKS50 to get 50% off. That's code FKS50 at factormeals.com slash FKS50 to get 50% off. Link is also in the description. Number five. Thank you so much for all that you guys do with THT Studios. Yeah. You have no idea the scope of things you've helped people with, so thank you. Anyways, I have what may sound like a dumb and immature issue, but I really need advice. I'm 24, female, living in a small city in Oregon. My entire life, I've gravitated towards non-traditional lifestyles. The thought of working a regular nine to five is enough to spiral me into a panic attack. Right now, I work as a pharmacy tech, and while the job is rewarding, now that I'm out of retail, I am always so exhausted. I don't have time for my passions. I've always wanted a career in social media, and Morgan's slash Justin's stories have inspired me to start a podcast. However, growing up in a small town and living in a smaller city, I am surrounded by small-minded people. Even my best friend and my significant other don't believe it's realistic to chase my dreams. I cannot keep living this life. The way our society was built is killing me. 
I'm so depressed and anxious most of the time. I just want to be happy. I want my life to be more than a job I hate to just barely pay the bills. How do I get through to people around me? I feel so lost. I don't have much family and the ones I do just do not understand. Do you have any advice? Ideal outcome? Probably being able to tune out everyone else and finally give my all to what I truly want to do. You've been a crazy entrepreneur. You've always kind of marched to the beat of your own drum. I have. You can start. I want you to first um, imagine what you want to do and to make sure that you really prepare to go the distance. Because as much as we do our our wonderful little um, forecasts, I'm going to make these widgets and these widgets are going to cost me 20 bucks to make. And I'm going to sell these widgets for, you know, a thousand or a hundred dollars a piece. And I'm going to sell 20,000 of these widgets. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. So be prepared that when you're doing this, that A, you know, you're going to be able to go the distance and know all aspects of what it is to do it. So I would actually start working for someone that is doing something that you want to do to see what really goes into it. Even if you don't make a lot of money doing it, go see what it takes to accomplish it. And that's the first place you start. And then you figure out, how do I do this and add my own twist into it that people really want to listen to? Mm -hmm. And then you sample it. You know, yes, I have done many entrepreneurial things. And some things I didn't give it long enough. I did a, a, a... a business model before you were born called Open House. You ever heard of it? No. It's uh, you take a video. People take a, a video camera and they walk through homes and they sell homes on Sunday. Oh morning. yeah, they're doing it. Mm-hmm. That was I started an open that 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 model two years before that thing went big. I lasted so long with it and I let it go. There's other things that I've done that I didn't go the distance. Mm-hmm. So you got to make sure that when they seem like they're fall, you know, you know, faltering, that you know that you have a backup plan to get through the faltering. You're either going to have money, investors, you're, you, you are going to be able to do whatever you can to make this thing get to the end day because it doesn't happen overnight without having struggle. It all takes, a, take, it takes dedication to your dream to make it really what you want. You'll have fun doing it. You'll get frustrated doing it. It will have all, it will give you every bit of it. And I even say that sometimes it's, it's the universe taking my palm tree and bending it all the way back to the pavement behind me and thinking (laughs) that there's no more to go. And then all of a sudden I realize, yeah, well, I was on the edge of a cliff and that, that tree can go back a little further and and stress me a little more. Yeah. I found a big pothole. And if you can deal with that, you'll be fine. But that's one of the thing about being uh, resilient as a resilient tree will make it through a hurricane or a storm before it's uprooted and th- tossed away. Mm-hmm. And sometimes those things are tossed away, but they reroute themselves. So <laughs> you want to be, you definitely have to have commitment to whatever you choose to do. And it's what you want. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this one? Uh, yeah, I'd agree. Cause I, I don't think any change or any goals accomplished without consistency. Mm -hmm. And what I find a lot is with in conversations with people, the main reason that a lot of people delay these things is because they keep increasing this list of why they can't go try it right now. Mm -hmm. There's certain things on the list that could be very valid, such as having kids or certain needs that literally prevent you from, Mm -hmm. you know, make it a bad idea to, oh, let's go just be risky and try this right now. But a lot of the things on people's list tend to not be very serious things. And it's like the best time to start is right now. And there's no reason not to try. Seems like you're in a place where you won't be giving up the future of everything if you leave and go just give this a try. So Mm -hmm. what's the worst that could happen? Well, that you figure out it didn't work and something else comes from it though. Yeah. Or like, or maybe it's something you need to work at a really long time and you end up needing to get some side jobs to support you doing this. But if your main job is in the way right now, 
then that will have an effect unless you can really not have burnout and grind through your non-working hours to try and make this other passion work. So it's it's a balance, but I think at the age you're at and in the life situation you're at right now, it sounds like let's give it a try. And if that requires moving to a different city or a different place that will encourage or just have more of that industry or whatever it is there, that could be a consideration. But the time is now. I mean, mm-hmm. We're in our early 20s. Let's let's go get it. Yeah. And I think like, I think if, you know, depending on what you really, really want to do, it might be hard where you're at and, you know, but it's not impossible. And I think you got to just start today. Um, when I started the podcast, most people in my life thought I was crazy. They were concerned. You're going to make money doing what and how? And you went to OT school. What are you doing? And I was talking, um, I think, at the meet and greet or, you know, before sometime this weekend with Lauren and even Lauren, like the first episode I said, yeah, well, you know, wherever you're listening all over the world. And Lauren kind of scoffed at it or she said it in a way that wasn't, you know, mean, but she was like, you said that. And I was like, what? No, no way. So you just got to go for it. It's it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. Um, while this is a privilege, a lot of burnout, growing a tough fucking skin. And People will try to discourage you yeah. until it works. And then everyone wants to be your best friend. Yeah, but there are like things to keep in mind too. Like prepare yourself that if you do blow up, like can you handle the criticism? Um, there are just things to prepare yourself that like I didn't because I didn't know. But you just got to start recording, start putting yourself out there, take videos on your iPhone. But I think I would try to find a job in social media and get your feet wet and make sure you like it and all of those things. Whatever you are going to come up with, make sure it's unique. Make sure there's a place for it that uh, there. I've learned one thing. There's There are people out there for everything out there. Sure is. But certainly make sure that whatever you're doing that is unique and it's all you. Mm-hmm. Because that's the that's something that's very special. When, when you guys came to me and said, you know, Jerry, you know, people are loving dad. They want to talk to dad. They realize that, you know, they want to be able to, to share, get your opinion on things. And I looked at you and I said, yeah, right. <laughs> and Justin said, no, 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 this is, this is going to be, you're going to be great. And we had a defined direction of what we were looking to do, to do. There was a direction. There was a, a format that he had in his mind that I would be talking to you, you know, people out there and we would be sharing these stories and you guys could take what you want from it and not take in and throw away what you don't want. We were comfortable enough that you were going to listen and you proved by the growth. Now, I think we have 40,000 uh, subscribers on on YouTube now. I looked the other day. And you, I, I don't know. Yeah, we do. Growing. So we hit 40. We hit 40. Oh, I think we're actually over 40. Go take a look. And I would say if you're not a subscriber. 39.2. 39.2. I'm you're off. Close. I'm close. <laughs> you're living you're in the close. future. So guys, guys, 39.2. There's your reminder to we, subscribe. We need 800 of you to press that button. Yeah. <laughs> Don't make me a liar. But it it really is that. And to and it becomes something that we look forward to doing. This You are a family out there. We do love reading the stories. We love sharing. And because we love it, it will grow. Yeah. But keep us posted. You can do it. Set your mind to it. So that's it for our show for tonight. So we will hope to see you next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. And Did you say bad time? Same bat time. Bat. See, I grew up in the- What does that mean? Well, I grew up with, with a show called Batman. And at the end of the at the end of the show, the announcer would go, "We'll see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel." Crazy. That yeah. was pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Go 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 look at it. All, go to one of the uh, old TV channels and look at Batman. Mm-hmm. The old episodes. The end. Okay. We got Patreon. Mm-hmm. And when's our next uh, uh, group session? Coming up real soon. Here. You got a date? Probably this Sunday. 
So all of you out there, watch out for group and come join us and bring your stories because that's really what I like to do is be able to interact and hear what's going on. And then everyone kind of gives their opinion and it's like sitting at a family table. Yeah. yeah. And some people actually bring their mimosas and drink them. They sure do. So yes, as Morgan said, bye, bye guys. Bye for now. Bye. We'll see you next week. Also come over to Patreon. Yeah. Bye. 